on the front line of the fight against Ebola, Liberia's poorly paid health workers have been risking their lives to treat the infected and recover the bodies of those who've died. But has their government been taking them for granted? And is the world doing enough to help? Soria Samora has been to investigate. Ebola is named after a river, a force of nature. It flows through our countries and it feels like we are drowning. The Ebola outbreak in West Africa claimed its first victim in a small village in southern Guinea. Patient Zero was a two-year-old boy, but how he caught the disease is still a mystery. For months as the disease spread, no one knew what it was. In March, the World Health Organization, or WHO, announced that the disease was Ebola. But by then, it had already infected almost 100 people and was on its way to neighboring Liberia and Sierra Leone. On August 8th, WHO declared the outbreak an international emergency. Today, the disease has reached epidemic proportions, bringing affected countries in West Africa to their knees and spreading to the US and Europe. I have come to Liberia where Ebola has claimed almost half its victims. It is the epicenter of this catastrophic outbreak. Two days before our arrival, the first case of Ebola in the US had been confirmed. For months, the virus had terrorized this country. Now, the whole world was gripped by fear. I have come to meet May Azango, a local journalist who will be joining me as I investigate the reality of fighting the most deadly outbreak of this disease in its recorded history. I asked me what she thought of the government's handling of the crisis. Soros, I will tell you, the government didn't care. Only normal people were dying, poor people were dying. But when this guy from the finance ministry died, it's when the government buckled up. We are serious, I'm going to form this task force. That was announced July 26th. Too late? Yes. That when a lot of people were dying, dead bodies were everywhere. The people feel the government have downplayed them. And yesterday, the government isn't doing anything. Money that comes, they don't know where the money goes. So they are angry. But some people are equally very critical about the international community. What, what, what's your take about their, their response? They were so slow in coming. Now they just announced the, the, the arrival of 3,000 troops. This late day, what happened in June? It's just like in Liberia said, alone, almost 3,000 people have died with over 6,500 reported infections. Across West Africa, almost 5,000 dead and almost 14,000 infected. The next day, we joined the Liberian Red Cross who are responsible for collecting dead bodies throughout the capital city of Monrovia. These burial teams are doing one of the most dangerous jobs in Liberia and must wear protective clothing known as PPE for their own safety. This is not just any kind of dead body. This is an infectious disease. There are protocols that you must follow. You must wear your PPEs properly. You must have a sprayer that goes around to disinfect the immediate environment, disinfect the body before the team moves in there picks up the body, put into the body bag, and at the end of that process, to even take out their PPEs, there are also protocols. Those that are picking the bodies, we are also very concerned about them that if you don't follow the protocol properly, you could be infected and yourself could be uh, a victim of the situation. In the name of Jesus, we say thank you and bless you. We give you the honor of God for everything you have us in Jesus' name. Amen. The first collection of the day, a young man on the outskirts of the city. His body left at this outhouse. Last night. Yeah, so, so the body has become stiff. Ebola is one of the world's most deadly diseases. There is no vaccine or cure. 
it is transmitted through bodily fluids and is most contagious after the death of the victim. One mistake can cost any or all of these workers their lives. Nearby, I found Robert, the younger brother of the dead man. We are we're, we're so, so sorry about your loss. What, what really happened? You didn't go to hospital? They didn't allow you in the hospital? No way. Why not? And you have been handling him? I became deeply worried for this young man. Against strict government advice, Robert had physical contact with his sick brother and even carried the dead body outside. It is one of the worst things about this disease, the way it attacks those giving care. A brother can't help his sick sibling. A mother can't hold her sick child. This family will need to be monitored for 21 days, Ebola's maximum incubation period. But for the burial team, their day has only just started. By mid-afternoon, their pickup truck was stacked with bodies and on its way to the crematorium. This is it. This is it for people who die of Ebola here in Liberia. Once they are driven through those gates into the crematorium, that's it, they disappear into thin air. No rituals, no ceremonies. And this is very difficult for us Africans because we are not used to burning our loved ones. We will bury them and put them in marked graves so that we keep the memories alive. But right now, it is so clear to me that not only is Ebola killing our loved ones, but it's really killing our cultures and traditions. Before leaving, I spoke to Robert, a member of the burial team. He is one of the heroes in this war. Every day he risks his life, and he's doing it for no payment. The essence of my being here to work for the Liberian people, the Red Cross, and the war at last is not to be on payroll. I'm doing this so as to have the particular singer alleviated from my country. I love my people. See my people dying there, it said it did satisfy me a lot. We hear that um, a lot of people who are working with Ebola victims or the dead are being stigmatized. Uh, have you had that kind of experience? I eat it alone at my house. Yeah. Carefully don't want to visit me. Friends don't want to visit me. That which I don't have problem with. As I said earlier, my major motive is to have my country set free. My country should be emancipated with respect to the Ebola issue. If Ebola is to be beaten, it will owe a lot to the character and selfless service of people like Robert. But while he and his team are tending to the dead, others are fighting to keep people alive. Medicines on Frontier have been fighting Ebola since the early days of the outbreak. These places are called Ebola treatment units, or ETUs. It is where people with Ebola must go to be cared for and isolated. These patients arriving with symptoms suspected to be Ebola can only be treated by workers in full protective clothing. Everyone else must remain at a safe distance. What must it feel like to be treated as such a threat? But the protocols are there for good reason. The majority of patients do not leave to walk out. But it is not all bad news from the ETUs. This young lady arrived here just a few weeks ago, suffering acutely with the disease. But she survived and is now a volunteer. Ebola, if you have it, you feel like it's a signal from another planet because it has 100% severe pain from hair to toes. You can even feel the pain in the marble of your bones. The formula just come and come and come, no rest. You call it 100 times a day, 50. No, no. 100. Because if you live in the bathroom, you won't reach to your door. You're coming back in the toilet. How can you then stand? You were not able to stand. You were caught to go to the bathroom. You got no strength. I never really thought that people can survive this virus. But it, when I started getting strong, 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 
I really used to praise God. I even used to dance. You can ask it, my sis. For those who survive Ebola, currently 40% of patients at this ETU, they develop immunity. Though for how long, we do not know. But for every survivor, there are more dying. Andrew is the assistant medical team leader. His cousin had just died during the previous night. Uh, I saw him just uh, yesterday uh, in the afternoon. I was there. I encouraged him. We even talked. He requested for a cellular phone because he wanted to be in communication with us at night. Uh, I was on my way here this morning. I wasn't feeling good. But then when I got here, I realized that he had passed during the night. He didn't make it. It doesn't care who you are. Once you contract the disease, um, I mean, if you live, fine. But we are dying. That's it. That's just it. We are dying. A devastating side of this outbreak has been the huge number of infections and deaths among the brave men and women working at these ETUs. In Liberia alone, over 100 of them have perished. While staff here continued their work, all was not well at the other government-run ETUs, after health workers had announced a strike. Medical staff were promised increased pay for risking their lives, but the pay increases were reduced. For years, health workers have been fighting the government over bad working conditions, lack of equipment, and low pay. So serious is this battle, leaders of the National Health Workers Association are on the run. Whether this government has been a failure to the Liberian people, they sit in their offices and just make decisions against us. We've got government fee, they are in a secure position where they can't get easily affected with the virus and the common people are getting affected, so they don't care. How many of you agree with what, what, what he's saying? Everybody, everybody, everybody. The entire country agree with him. This is a period when Liberia needs everyone, its resources, its people. You know, is this the right time for you guys to go on strike? We are sacrificing our lives to see our brothers and sisters get all right. And you go into the ETU, we are working. We do sit down. We do even sit when we go there. We stay on our feet until we come outside. There, there are reports that money is being given by the international community, by other governments in the West to help. What do you guys think the government is doing with that money? Our own disappointment as health workers, Debbie Asia brought their staff that are paying 200, 300 per hour. Oh, yeah. Then we that are doing the dirty work, we are paying yeah, 300 for what? Dirty for dirty for, for money. These people are so, so angry. It, it, it's worrying. If these people walk out of the ETU, we will have a catastrophe, serious one. But this government official, these senators, all these people you see showing up here, right in these flashy cars, they all have their children in the U.S. going to school. Whereas our poor people are dying, the health workers are on the front line, while our own children are seated home because they cannot go to school, because they're Ebola. How do you expect my daughter to learn? Whether we eat, whether we live, they don't care. The anger I saw at the ETU was clearly not limited to the medical staff. I could see it just as vividly in the face of my Liberian colleague. But I wanted to get to the bottom of the situation facing the health workers. We managed to track down one of the leaders of the National Health Workers Association, George Williams, who was in hiding as he claimed he was wanted for arrest. George has been unemployed since February after the health ministry dismissed him for his part in protest against the government. Our colleagues who die, it hurts us a whole lot. They could not have died if there were protective gears, but we're going to save lives only to lose our lives. And we don't even have sufficient health workers in this country. George claimed that not only had the government reduced risk pay for health workers, they were also claiming to pay them a total monthly salary of $500, when in truth, they were only paying $280. We don't know why would somebody want to put figures against us that we don't see, we don't feel, we don't have. More than a year ago, we called for an audit 
of this ministry activity so we can all be on a check and balance because why there are no medications in the hospital why there are no gloves no protective gears why there's nothing anywhere and we hear figures we don't see anything that dropped from those figures you um, were taking home your meager uh, 280 US dollars a, a month then the government has decided they're not going to um, employ you again, they're going to drop you. Um, how do you look after your family? How do you survive? My country is more than my family and I. We have real difficult time. It's a big challenge, but I just feel that um, our country needs this kind of a time that people can come out, some people who will speak the truth, so the truth can set our nation free. Ebola has exposed the terrible weakness of Liberia's healthcare system, but it has also exposed the Liberian people's deep mistrust of their own government. And you can see why. This audit report of the Ministry of Health highlights many financial discrepancies. Yet nothing is seen to be done, and Liberia's president, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, is viewed by many here with as much contempt as many of Africa's most corrupt leaders, despite her high international standing. We tried to interview the president to discuss the claims made against her government, but it didn't happen. For most Liberians, including me, failure of leadership is what they expect. This country has experienced two civil wars in the last 20 years alone. And watching May go home in the evening to tutor her 12-year-old daughter, it was another stark reminder of the challenges facing this country and its people. When I go to work, I come back, even if I'm tired, I still have to tutor my daughter. And the, the children, most especially the girls, they are growing. Time is going. When a child sat for one year and they don't go to school, after the war, we had not even built the system. And then Ebola has come there again. So the system is completely broken down. When are we going to pick up our broken pieces? For me, May's words hit close to home. My own country, Sierra Leone, has also been deeply affected by Ebola and has barely recovered from its own civil war in the 90s. The disease has preyed on the weakness of our nations. A weakness that has left us pleading for help to the international community. After a long and much criticized silence, these pleas were finally heard. We spoke to the country representative of the World Health Organization. It's true that, uh, that, the, that the world reacted late, that the world started to react in August, definitely in September. But I would say since I came six weeks ago here, um, I've seen a tremendous change in terms of the response. It's ramping up very rapidly right now. How are donations allocated? And how do you monitor? Because a lot of Liberians, including myself, don't trust the government. If it goes to the government, just like with any other partner, they will have to enter an agreement. Everybody has to show the invoices. And we, in the end, have to show that to our donor. You know, what is it? that you think is standing in the way of the fight against Ebola here? The one thing that will end the outbreak is that when somebody doesn't feel well, he or she wants to protect his or her loved ones and says, I need to step out of my home, I need to step out of my community, I need to go to a place where I'm taken care of, but I want to make absolutely sure that I don't infect my family. And that is going to be ultimately the success of our, our common effort. That common effort continues apace. We joined an Ebola investigation team who respond to emergency calls. They have been called to one of the city's most densely populated areas, the sort of place where Ebola thrives. We were told that a suspected Ebola victim was on the roof of this building, but that he was attempting to run away. The depth of mistrust towards the government means many Liberians continue to resist official advice. When the outbreak started, most people here believed it was a government scam to steal money. 
the impact of the public's ignorance and denial has been catastrophic. After questioning, it was clear the young man displayed Ebola symptoms. As a suspected case, he will be forcibly taken to an ETU and tested. The young man was sitting down, vomiting from this morning. All the people came in, that if this man stay here, Ebola people come, they will bring him, they will kill him. All of her fears, but now... Fear has overrun the whole country. The health facility in the country all is shut down because of the same fear. This country right now, all the hospitals are closed. Women are dying in labor pain. Women deliver outside. This is a disgrace of Africa. The collapse of almost the entire healthcare system has devastated the country. Even the country's largest hospital, JFK, is barely functioning. We came upon a protest about the death of a young woman called Nakita Fo, who had died of an asthma attack at JFK. After hospital staff refused to treat her until she had been fully tested for Ebola. Nakita is the daughter of an elected member of parliament, Edward Foe, but even his power couldn't help her. The funeral on the 10th of October was a stark contrast to the unceremonious cremation that await most dead in the city. But this was clearly no consolation for the devastated family. I took her to the JFK hospital, but they were not comfortable to use their exact word. And when I asked why, they said, uh, because of the fear for Ebola. I held her in my arms and we went to the emergency area. I ran out of breath, I collapsed on the ground, and that's where she lied down and died after one hour. Under a drizzle, it was drizzling, the rain was drizzling. And it was the drizzle under which she died. And their consciences, they must, they must stand up to what they did. They killed my daughter. The, the, the institution killed my daughter. The government killed my daughter. Uh, the Ebola crisis have kind of exposed uh, how bankrupt our health system is. But uh, knowing that AIDS have come, knowing that budgets have passed over the last nine years, and yet we have what we have, that is sad. The death of young Liberians like Nakita reveals the hidden impact of this terrible outbreak. She was not infected by Ebola, but it killed her nonetheless. Edward was at least able to bury his daughter and have a funeral. Most of the bereaved here will never have that comfort. I went to check up on the family of the deceased man the burial team collected on our first day. I was worried for the younger brother, Robert, who had cared for his brother and carried his dead body. When I arrived, I was relieved to find he hadn't fallen sick. There were concerns that if it looks like Ebola, you should not go near the person or touch them. That's my brother, so I don't want him to be sorry. Why aren't you afraid? Because no one will be alive to go starting to be having the feeding the love and the care of the brother love. No one to go starting, so I got to be sorry. The cruelty of Ebola is how it preys on our natural humanity. Just how many more families will suffer the same fate is yet to be seen. We spoke to Tolbert Nienswa, the Assistant Minister of Health, who is in charge of the fight against Ebola here in Liberia. The work has taken shape. We have control over the intervention and are making significant progress. This should be a lesson learned that unprecedented outbreak in the sub-region in West Africa. The international world knew what Ebola was, but acted very late. And they knew very well the health system of Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone did not have the capacity to deal with this situation. Now the disease is in Europe, it's in America, it's going all over the world. They are now coming because they see the gravity. Human life is human life. When diseases strike, we should come together and fight the disease. The Ebola outbreak has exposed many difficult truths. 
Ebola caught the world flat-footed. Here it has exposed not only the weakness of the healthcare system, but also a deep anger and mistrust of the people for their own government. A mistrust born of decades of corruption that seems to be continuing to this day. For me, the real damage is the cold barrier of fear it creates between people. Fear of a terrible disease that can kill in days. Fear of a disease that needs to be stopped.